It's the middle of summer, but it feels like Christmas with all these parts that are coming in. So I've never done an unboxing video before, so I'm just going to give it my best shot. I guess I'll leave unboxing vids to the professionals. mine cancelled his build so I traded some stuff for his PCIe SSD and a larger SSD for storage. Also among the parts are two high pressure fans for my radiator and two silent fans with great looking edges to cool my board components. There's an excellent 600 watt small form factor power supply and an assortment of premium liquid cooling components. Finally, some great DDR4 from Patriot. Patriot has been really kind to me proving that beggars can be choosers and worked extra hard to find me 16GB of Viper Extreme in black to match my build. Of course, there was still something missing, but that arrived as the sun was coming down. Sapphire's flagship Tri-X Fury. They let me know that they had another GPU on the way for my build, but to have fun with this R9 high bandwidth memory decked monster. There is nothing cheap about this card, and the amount of metal where plastic could have been used is impressive. Of course, the first thing that popped in my head was to purchase a gorgeous piece of expensive hardware precariously over saltwater and take photos of it. Yeah, hopefully they'll loan me some more cards in the future, but after this video, I'm not so sure it's gonna happen. I'm super grateful for the help I received in order to make this build happen. This should be the fastest personal rig I've ever owned by a large margin, and I promise only use its powers for good, for truth, justice, and the American way. I chose the 5820K because I wanted to spend too much money instead of too much all of my money on the 8-core version. But seriously, if I primarily use my PC for gaming and overclocking, there are economically way better options. And I could have bought more cool stuff with the money I saved. But I wanted to use a small form factor power supply for this build, and every watt counts in my CAD, 3D rendering, and video editing rig. I didn't have an air cooler for the X99 socket but I did have a block of finned metal, some thermal paste, and a fan. Maybe it will be just enough to keep the PC from resetting during initial testing. During some benchmarking, I was treated to a light show on the Fury X. At first I thought it might have been the audio levels for the HDMI out, because, uh... <laughs> but after some actual benchmarking, it was more obvious it measures card load. How did it perform? <laughs> Outstanding! Sapphire's take on the R9 Beast is the luxurious build quality and silent operation under load, both of which I give a thumbs up to. But go read some actual reviews. Darn it, Jim. I'm a modder, not a journalist. So while I was diligently test... Um, okay, I was playing in the system. <laughs> Another box arrived. Patriot had asked me earlier if I wanted to spend a couple weeks taking a first look at some new products they'd be releasing shortly. Of course, I calmly, without jumping up and down and squealing, said yes. In the box was a set of headphones, a keyboard, and a mouse. All three of these products came at a great time, and I eagerly took them for a spin. I started with the mouse because, as I mentioned earlier, I was in need of a replacement. Although super aggressive in shape, I found it to be comfortable and surprisingly ergonomic. On the thumb side, there's a rubber inlay, which is different from the rubberized soft touch that coats the rest of the mouse. The DPI switch is out of the way, preventing accidental switching, which I suppose could be a good or bad thing depending on the scenario. My favorite part of the mouse is the scroll wheel, which feels great and is super easy to click in, left, and right. The mouse slides well on my desk, even without a mouse pad, thanks to its five metal coasters. And the LED accent lighting can be changed right on the mouse. And as we all know, red increases its performance by 13.7%. The Viper keyboard uses brown KLH switches. I'm a blue boy myself, but I do own a vanilla keyboard with these switches, and honestly, I like the feel. It's different than cherry keys for sure, but still good. I dig the ergonomics of the keyboard, which has really clicky feet for raising the board, and features a neato palm rest that magnetically attaches. Magnets, how do they work? The keyboard has nice aluminum accents and a braided cable. The LEDs has several modes, all of which can be controlled without any software, which is really nice. But the coolest one in my opinion was the reaction mode, which lights up each key as you press it and it slowly fades out. Lastly, I looked at the headset. Its aggressive looks complement the Viper branding, 
and it has a great looking braid cord which matches the Viper mouse. The headphones are coated in the same rubberized soft touch material that is found on parts of the keyboard and mouse in the lineup. Like the other two pieces, these cans are LED studded and glow a menacing red, which is good because that makes them sound 16% better than similar headphones without LEDs. <laughs> of course. The headphones are super comfortable, something I forgot wearable noisemakers could be after all these years with earbuds. For kicks, I tried using the mic to make some recordings, and was pretty happy with the quality. All these products have a couple more features and boast a few more tricks, but I have no intention of doing an actual review. I just thought it'd be interesting to share my first look at them, and give my friends at Patriot a little promotion. After all, modding without hardware would just be sculpture, I guess. Darn it, Jim, I'm a mod. Oh wait, I uh, said that already. Okay, back to the fab. I got up early in the morning because I wanted to mark and drill out the mating holes for my L brackets, which are these beefy steel straps I bent for another mod I never finished. I thought it would be much easier to drill now than after my part was bent. I finished up by countersinking the holes for my SSD mounts. For the bend, I took my tower plate to a metal bending shop down the road. I used these guys for my last major mod and was happy to see my Jeep's cousin waiting there to greet me as before. These guys were happy to help and dropped what they were doing to assist me. The part turned out good, but because the depth of the bend, I still need to make a couple more simple adjustments. Which uh, was harder than I thought. I had to shift my strategy to using clamps and heat to release some stress. I was hoping this would make the bend settle. It worked, a little, but the aluminum was so thick and there was so much of it, I had to spend a very long time applying heat. When I was satisfied with the geometry, I began looking for my taps to start the rough assembly. Finding them can actually be a challenge. I worked on the tower first and applied even pressure with lots of lubricant. When I was finished with the tower, I deburred the part and worked out any marks that would show up after painting. The motherboard tray was next, and it didn't take too long to get some 5 16th by 20 threads in my holes. I brought the parts inside and used some temporary bolts I had to make the motherboard tray with the tower. I temporarily clamped my fan bracket to the motherboard tray to see how it would look, and then turned over the tower to install the L brackets. After those were in place, I could stamp the tower enough to mark the holes with a cell cast acrylic base. I've used this material before and is extremely strong, optically clear, and beautiful. After it was marked, I put some holes in it, which didn't take too long, although I forgot to film the countersinking and finishing process for the nuts. Back inside, I eagerly clamped the fan bracket to the motherboard tray, made the adjustments until I liked where it was. Then I marked the holes which would later secure the two parts together and remove them from the tower. I did this to make the base easier to install and because of the tight tolerances, this ended up being a good idea. Well, my time with the amazing R9 Fury was up and I needed to send it back. So after tidying up my office, I boxed her up and said my goodbyes. Luckily, the box containing the new GPU showed up the same day. And I gotta be honest, I was in no way expecting such a high-end card. This had to have been among the first backplate R9 390 Nitros. The card uses two 4-pin connectors as expected, and has a UEFI mode switch like its big brother. Man, I don't think I need to make a comment on how it looks. But I will anyways, this card is GORGEOUS! I'm super excited because like their R9 285 ITX, it's monochromatic and understated. This card will match any build. And to be honest, it's something I've been asking Sapphire to do for years. If for some reason anyone wanted to remove the graphics, a little goo off would not hurt the beautiful brushed and ice finish, but I personally love them. They add dynamism to the card without screaming ostentatiously. I'm officially offering my congratulations to all the people who worked on and approved this design. Sapphire, you knocked this one out of the park. Black, 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 gray. This build is going to look awesome. So quiet is not a descriptive word for this card. Idling sometimes the fans don't even spin. Like its big brother, this card is silent under load, and the fans only kick in when necessary, and it's not necessary very often. Well, as fun as it was to play with the new card, I need to figure out how to mount it. So the challenge for this project is going to be mounting the GPU to the case. 
Um, I didn't really come up with the design in my 3D design. I had an idea in my head, and that idea is to take this card and to mount it like so. And I didn't f actually do the 3D model because I didn't really know the positioning of the card, but now everything is in place. I can do it. What I want to try to do is take this bracket, cut it up, and rigidly mount it to the motherboard tray, something like that. That way, the GPU can actually thread in. Um, and then for the tabs, the uh, tabs on the GPU PCI key, I'm going to bend another piece of metal and attach it right here so it will slide in there and I can screw it in. My plan was in motion and so was my angle grinder. I started with cutting the card retainer bracket down, but then moved on to an abrasive wheel to shape the edges into something more pleasing. As well as holes for the GPU bracket, the motherboard tray still needs some work for the fan bracket. Tapping the tray was tough. I always hate using little taps and these 632 ones always seem to break. And sure enough, I broke one off in a hole. In the past, I would have tried drilling out the tap, but I've since learned my lesson that drilling out a hardened titanium coated tap is futile. I used a punch this time and it got it out pretty quickly. My fan bracket, which as a side note is from my limited run of my arc chassis, needed to be over drilled for pass through screws, so I quickly knocked that out of the way. With all my parts completed, I could finally put them all together and see just how much I screwed up. I still need to make the GPU's resting tab, and I plan on doing that with some aluminum angle bar and rivets, but I'll worry about that tomorrow. For now, I just want to smoke a cigar, take it easy, and enjoy my progress.